Welcome, everyone. We are just uh, getting started with our fourth installment of our uh, webinar series. So um, we are bringing with you here today our webinar series called Leading Through Crisis. It is hosted jointly by the Guelph Chamber of Commerce, the University of Guelph's Lang School of Business and Economics, and the John F. Wood Center for Business and Entrepreneurship. My name is Melanie Lang, and I'm here today wearing uh, a couple of different hats. So the first one is the Executive Director of the John F. Wood Center for Business and Student Enterprise. Uh, we are an innovation and entrepreneurship center housed within the Lang School of Business. And secondly, as a proud executive board member with the Guelph Chain Commerce. So now before we get started, if I could ask that you please just take a second and complete the poll that is currently up on your screens. This will help our panelists understand who is in the audience with us here today. Uh, and also, if you could just note that throughout our webinar here today, we will be posting some polls. Uh, so if you could just also take a moment when you see those come up to answer each one of them. So now, as I mentioned, our webinar today, we are going to analyze the current economic crisis caused by the pandemic and its long term implications. Our expert panel will provide insights on how the virus has impacted the economy, the financial markets, um, with both a macro and a micro perspective. So we just have a couple of housekeeping items uh, to review with you before we get started. Feel free to submit your questions throughout the webinar. There is a chat feature that has been enabled and we will try to take questions after each segment uh, as well as at the end of the webinar. Now we have also enabled upvoting. So if you see a question that you would also like to have answered, you can simply upvote it and that will ensure that we are able to see um, some of the other questions that will be brought more forward for us um, and then we can, we can ask our panelists with us here today. Okay, so um, I actually have uh, been able to see a glimpse of the results of the first panel that we have seen. Uh, so with us here on the call, the majority of our viewers with us here today are small business owners. With, um, you know, following suit, we have some educational institution representatives, uh, as well as those within the large business sector. And then as you can see, as you go along, we also have folks visiting us from uh, representing government, not-for-profit, um, who are entrepreneurs, business owners, um, also within the professional, uh, professional field. So thank you for completing that. All right, so let's jump right in. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce uh, two of our experts that we have on the call with us today. Um, our first is Jim Jarrell, who is President and COO of Linamar Corporation, one of Canada's leading auto parts manufacturers. Linamar is based in Guelph and the company's operations employ more than 29,000 people worldwide across 60 manufacturing plants, eight R&D centers, 25 sale offices in 17 countries. Now, since joining Linamar, Mr. Jarrell has held senior leadership positions within the company including the management of Linamar subsidiaries, Comtech, Vacom, Diversacast, and LPP. Now also joining us today is a professor of finance from the Lang School of Business, which is Professor Nikola Gradojevic. Nikola received his PhD degree in financial economics from the University of British Columbia. He has held positions at the University of British Columbia, Bank of Canada, um, the um, IEC School of Management and in the private sector as a consultant in the financial and mining industries. His research has been published in leading journals and examines high frequency trading and international finance, risk management, forecasting, cryptocurrencies and asset price volatility. So I would now like to invite our panelists uh, forward um, and we will actually be beginning with Nicola. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, thanks to all the webinar participants uh, for joining us today. Uh, well, I'd like to start by providing an overview of the crisis because what we're experiencing today is different from anything we've seen in the past. Uh, historically and typically, uh, financial crises are caused by speculative bubbles, uh, toxic new securities, 
uh, computer glitches, deregulation, accounting frauds, even terrorist attacks like 9-11. But this one is different. It originated in a global health crisis that basically caused an economic and financial turbulence. And now we're slipping into recession. So this one is new. Uh, the only comparable crisis is the one that happened in 1918, which is a Spanish flu pandemic. But that one coincided with the end of the First World War. So it's difficult to understand how that impacted the economy in addition to the World War I. Uh, so what happened in the stock markets is a huge drop uh, at a record pace. Uh, in a month, we basically lost about 30% uh, in value in, in the major stock market indices. But still the largest to date loss uh, in one day was 1987, a stock market crash, when we lost about 20% in a single day. So this one is not as bad, but it's still very bad. Uh, so given all this, uh, the uncertainty surrounding this was unprecedented. Uh, and in finance, we cannot really measure uncertainty. So what we try to do is to measure risk, because risk we can hedge and we can try to eliminate them but uncertainty is absolutely unpredictable because it has no distribution of probabilities that we can understand. So I will start with the VIX, which is the volatility index. And the VIX is a measure of risk that we use. And it's a forward looking measure uh, based on the market's participants' perception of risk. Uh, and what we, have, it, what we had with the pandemic was similar to 2008 uh, subprime mortgage crisis, slightly higher. So coronavirus, uh, peak of the VIX was about 82% uh, at the market close, uh, while the uh, 2008 crisis was about 80. So this happened on March the 16th. Uh, and then, but the trigger was substantially different. So only in, the, in terms of risk, we can compare these two. But the other one, the 2008 subprime mortgage crisis had a long buildup. So it was a completely different beast from this one. Uh, it's important to know that the long-term volatility uh, VIX target is about 20%. And from this peak of, of 82, now today we're down to about 30%. So it looks like markets are recovering and there is not so much risk that they're forecasting, but still uh, we don't understand this virus well enough to, to say that you know, the, the risk is gone. Uh, so we have to, you know, we're still cautious about this. Even my own research showed that some of the nervousness of the market started in December 2019. Uh, and this sentiment prevailed, even though it was not as extreme as we saw on uh, March the 16th. So what we have today is a bear market. We call that for, for the, like it's a declining market and it's in line with the historical averages of about 40% in equities. So this was challenging for all asset classes. Basically uh, all asset class classes, you know, they had a loss. Uh, except for government bonds and gold prices that gained. Uh, but this is typical for recessions. You know, these are, these are used as a safe haven uh, and basically investors go and buy gold and this happened in the early 2000s and it happens, it's happening today. Uh, meanwhile, oil prices dropped significantly, uh, more than 100%. So at some point the prices were even negative, which is mathematically uh, kind of impossible. Uh, and it all originated basically in, um, in lower demand and this inability of the OPEC and Russia to agree on the supply. The Bank of Canada tried to uh, influence all this by reducing interest rates. So from 1.75 in January, we had the cut to 0.25, which we have today. Now forecasts. Uh, forecasts are not, uh, <laughs> not very bright, uh, but I will try not to be pessimistic. Uh, so Expert Development Canada forecasted that our economy will shrink by about 9.4% uh, by the end of 2020, which is a lot. And only the first quarter, the, sh uh, the economy shrank by uh, minus 2.6%. Uh, meanwhile, the U.S. It was minus 4.8%. Uh, so it's, it's pretty bad in terms of the uh, forecast and everything. But EDC also forecasted that the recovery may start and will probably start towards the end of, uh, of this year and the first quarter of the next year. Now, Canada was hurt a lot because of the dependence on international trade, uh, dependence on oil commodities, sorry, energy commodities, which is oil, natural gas, and other cyclical commodities. Our debt to income ratio is high. It's about 180%, 180%. It also depends on the US a lot. 51% uh, of imports 
uh, come from the U.S. and 75% of the exports in Canada go to the U.S. So that, that's a huge fraction. And so we're very dependent on the U.S., which is on one hand a good thing because the U.S. is already opening. So that may help us uh, in the long run. So to summarize, uh, because uh, between five and 10 minutes to speak, uh, volatility will continue, uh, but it should stabilize once the healthcare crisis is resolved. Uh, I'd be very cautious about the short run, uh, but I'm more confident about the long run. I'm more optimistic. I would still buy stocks with attractive valuations because you could find a lot of undervalued stocks, but again, you have to be cautious and, and willing to accept risk of, of this situation. Uh, you have to diversify your portfolios for the long-term gain, for sure. You have to diversify well. And uh, don't sell in this bear market. Like I would hold, I would not sell because you, know, you want to try to buy the maximum pessimism, uh, not to sell because eventually, and it, the history tells us this will all come back to normal. The question is only when. So markets will recover and they're already recovering. Stock markets regain about half of the losses from the peak. So there could be, uh, I, I'm not sure how quickly we're gonna come back, but we're coming back. Now, some economists are very pessimistic. Like Nurul Rubini from NYU, he's very pessimistic. He forecasts a reduction in supply and, and huge inflation. Uh, but Warren Buffett, on the other hand, is very optimistic. And, and I'm, I'm gonna just paraphrase him. The US economy will always prevail. That, that's his view, which is interesting. And, and it makes sense because historically, uh, we always prevailed. So uh, I, I, I hope this will pass as well. It's just, it's just a matter of how long it will last. That's all. Great. Thanks so much, Nicola. I appreciate, uh, appreciate your, your view, your lens on that and summarizing that for us. Now, we do um, have a couple of questions that have come up um, while you were speaking. So, um, so the first one that we have here is, is there an opportunity to implement policy changes of growing concern? So for instance, wealth distribution, climate change, that sort of thing, as the economy begins to start again, or is it wiser? Is it a wiser choice to let the economy restart on its own? I think the government is doing a great job already. And I think they should be taken a very active role in the process. So we have this monetary response, which is already that we have these very low interest rates. And Canada was in a good position because our interest rates were already relatively high uh, relative to Europe. So there was room to cut them. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, I, I, can, I can tell that there is a lot of quantitative easing happening and, and credit easing. But the main fiscal stimulus that we should have is, is going to households. So I, I, can, I can call these uh, helicopter drops, basically, or parachute help. Uh, and, and I think that's what the government should be doing. And I think they're already doing it. So uh, I think it's happening. The government is, is active and I can see that happening every day. So it's good. It's good, okay. Now, when you were, when you were giving your, uh, your bit of an overview, you touched on a little bit in around uh, like diversification and that sort of thing in terms of um, you know, what people should be looking at in, uh, as of right now. So, so expanding a little bit on that, what, what do you feel determines you know, short term? Is it six months? Are we talking 12 months? Um, and then within those time frames, um, with what you're seeing, do you feel as though investors are behaving irrationally or rationally? What's your sense on that? I'd say that, okay, the short term versus long term. Mm -hmm. uh, short term is, to me, it's about two to three quarters. Okay. And when you go beyond three quarters, it, it's already becoming like next year. So mm -hmm. that would be, for me, long term. So the first quarter of next year, we should see some kind of recovery happening. Uh, in terms of the irrational behavior, I think so far the investor had been rational. Like it was nothing extreme relative to what happened in the past. And I'm really happy to see stock markets recovering and even old oil prices recovered recently a little bit. So that is, that is a very positive sign, both of those. So I wouldn't say that investors were irrational. I think investors are rational throughout the crisis and it's still happening. So on that, on that note, in terms of how we're responding uh, responsibly, I guess you could say, to what's to what's happening. So I appreciate your summary and your overview. Um, so with that, just getting that bit of a macro uh, perspective, I would like to now turn to Jim um, and hear from Jim and, and get his sense in terms of what's happening within uh, within his you know, more of a micro lens, perhaps uh, within the organization. So thank you for that, uh, Nicola. Sure, thanks. 
Can you hear me and can you see me? I can hear you and see you. Awesome. Okay, so, hey, it's great to be here today and, and really appreciate uh, having some time to give some insight from maybe the Linamar side. Um, certainly, uh, we've been doing these type of things in Linamar for about six weeks now, and really we found it really valuable. And the other thing that I got to say too, when, when I do these, uh, two things come out at me is, uh, first, I notice that I got to get a haircut soon. I'm sure a lot of people need that. And the second thing, I'm starting to miss a lot of people I don't even like. So, I mean, uh, it's quite uh, a time in, in today's society. And, and I think Nicola gave a great uh, macro overview. And I think one thing that uh, we start every meeting in Linamar is what you see here is, and it really goes nicely along with uh, sort of the theme that you started with. And really it's tough times don't last, but tough teams do. And we really consider ourselves a tough team at Linamar, and I'm sure a lot of people are dealing with the same sort of thing. And you also see up there Linamar Health First, and that is the overall perspective that we're giving this uh, COVID concept, where really it's the health and safety of our people first, and then also the health of the overall company. And so, you know, I think as the um, initial shock of this crisis sort of begins to slow down i think we're all thinking what's going to happen in the next month you know six months and and the next year and nicola sort of gave us some perspective on this i think also we know that this crisis is really starting to wear on people and i think from our side we are constantly staying flexible we're staying very vigilant and we're really being prepared you know for what's going on and i think you know, it's clear to me that we've also come to a bit of a, a fork uh, in the road during this crisis. This is actually a, a, a um, photo out of the, I think, Hamilton Spectator a few weeks ago. And I think a lot of people in this crisis are looking at this a little differently, that the medical side is really warning us in regards to a second COVID wave, which you also see there. So very concerned about how do we start up and a lot of businesses and politicians, you know, were really calling to reopen uh, society and to avoid that and minimize that sort of secondary uh, wave that you see coming behind us. And many people are saying, look, you got to decide between the two. And ultimately, I don't think so. I think we really need to, to end up doing both. And, you know, I think this work resilience is absolutely critical for all of us in business in education in health you know it's really the capacity to recover from difficulties that toughness that we're going to need to have over the next several quarters and I think that is really uh, critical as I stated we have a Linamar health first program and again it's about the health and safety of our people and about the health of the company. And the best way really is to, you know, act like you have this already. And we use that every week when we're talking about this inside the company. And every, every day, this is a screenshot of what I look at. It's basically employee data uh, around the world in our Health First intranet site. And really we're tracking a lot of things. We're talking people on self-quarantine that are working. We're talking about people that are on self-quarantine not working, people on vacation, absenteeism, people on layoff, people on work subsidies, and then also, you know, presumptive cases of COVID, um, cases of recovery, and people that are, uh, you know, in the COVID situation. And, you know, really a sad statistic is in Linamar, we've had two two people succumb to, to COVID, uh, one in Europe and one over in North America. And really that, that hits home when you see some of this. So we're really using the day-to-day -day data, looking at a micro concept of every single day, we're looking at this type of data in the company. Hey Jim, and just, um, just wanted to quickly interject for a moment. I'm wondering if you would be able to share the screen that you are uh, speaking from. I think it would be really helpful for those who are listening. Um, and also to just note those uh, as a follow up, we will be sharing the PowerPoint slides. Uh, so you'll be able to follow along with the recording afterwards as well. Okay, yeah, let me, I thought that was being shared. No problem. So down at the bottom of your screen, there should be that little share green button. Yeah, hang on a second. 
No problem. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, we're just technically just not able that's to do okay. that. That's no problem. So sorry to interrupt. If you wanted to go ahead then and finish your thought, we'll yeah. be sure to share the slides afterwards with everyone. Yeah. Yeah, it's unfortunate that we're not seeing them. But anyway, okay. I think some of the key, again, maybe I'll talk more in general then because it, it you can't see the slides. But, you know, from the overall Linamar perspective, you know, the shutdown that we've been occurring, we, you know, have really agree with this and really long enough to keep the curve sort of flattened. And really the, the concept of starting up again is going to be a real tough call um, and has to be managed carefully. But to give you some perspective on where we are. So from an automotive perspective, China has been up and running uh, since about late February. Europe basically started up a little bit last week. And North America started a little bit this week, but really going to start, you know, the week of May 18th. And then when you look at our ag business, ag business really is not starting you know, back, you know, for another another week or so, but mm -hmm. has start. So really that perspective is really going around the world looking at that. Um, the safety protocol for us coming back online is really critical and certainly our concept of that, that from a micro perspective is really set up the proper screening, um, really have the proper you know PPE in place. Social distancing is really critical. You know managing the cleanliness of each of our facilities is really important. And then also ultimately a tracing uh, concept that we've also set up place. And we've worked with, you know, WHO, we've worked with, you know, some of our larger customers and, and other companies to really get a, a benchmark uh, set up to have people come back to work. Um, yeah, so maybe that, that I think maybe from a lesson learned overall um, to give you some of that side, the way we work um, day to day in the company. I mean, we have set up a disciplined uh, system around, you know, the weekly uh, setup and really on, on Mondays, we have a COVID task force that meets uh, to review all of our organizational issues. We have a communication uh, layout for the week. Um, Tuesdays, we go around the world. We have every business unit uh, tell us where each customer uh, is, is set up and employee data. Uh, Wednesdays, we talk about opportunities in the company for growth, for innovation. Mm. Um, and, uh, and then Thursdays is all about, uh, you know, the financial side of the company, looking at where we're going, um, how we're going to get there, approving cash. Um, and I think, as Nicholas said, prediction, um, really tough to do right now, predicting where we're going to go. Um, you know, we say often predicting the future is pretty easy. Uh, predicting it right is, is pretty difficult. So really, and then Fridays we do an internal webinar like this. And unfortunately, we, we weren't able to share some of this stuff. Um, and we do a lessons learned on Friday. And we also talk about community support. And, you know, one thing we're really proud about, and I'm sure a lot of companies are proud about this in the outside world, is the amount of people that have stepped up to help the uh, communities around the world. And I would say Guelph is no different. Our leaders here are no different than leaders on the phone really stepped up without having to be uh, asked or told about that. So, so really that, uh, you know, is important. And uh, I think lessons learned really, I think manufacturing and business are absolutely critical to the economy, which is good for all of us that are in, in this situation. I think we really need to be prepared for the next wave or, or the next pandemic. And I think there's a lot of things we can do to that. Certainly a lesson learned communities really come together in this situation, which is great to see. Um, gotta act flexible, you gotta act fast. And then the, the last sort of thing that I would leave sort of on a lesson learned is really, you know, my health is in your hands and your health is in my hands. And I think that's something we've all sort of learned uh, through this uh, COVID uh, situation. No, I appreciate that final thought, Jim. That's very interesting. And you've said a couple of things throughout your talk that I just kind of wanted to circle back and, and touch on, if you don't mind. 
Um, you, uh, you know, as was explained at the beginning, obviously Linamar is in a number of different countries, right? And so we look at that global presence that you have, how is it that you're managing, um, you know, given that each region obviously would have its own uh, market conditions and, and um, uh, you know, practices, how are you managing across, across all of those, uh, across all of those regions? Yeah, I think it's a it's a valid question because every region is a little bit different in their their market conditions and coming back. Um, so, again, how we manage is really um, on a day to day basis. But we have again set up some pretty um, routine based systems around meeting cadences and really touch points. And I think I mentioned a few of them in regards to how we're managing cash and and forecasts ultimately talking about customers, you know, locally and getting a real read of that. So we, you know, once a week, we have all of our global team together. Um, and we're talking about the customer issues, we're talking about employee issues, all based around our COVID sort of task force and setup. So we really are managing, you know, region by region, but really, you know, pulling that information all together centrally so that we can then decide on how things are going to progress. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, that's helpful. And, and of course, you know, it, it requires a great deal of that flexibility and adaptability that you were speaking of just a few moments ago, right? Making sure that all of those elements are in line and able to meet the demand as it comes up as, as different markets come back to that level of consistency. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on was this notion of innovation and not, I'm not just interested simply because I, I run an innovation center an entrepreneurship and innovation center, but, but also too, because I believe, um, you know, that during these times of crisis, this is when the greatest, you know, innovation, whether it be processes or innovative, um, you know, new disruptions, uh, come about. And so what is your sense on, you know, will this current crisis and, and economic situation, how is that going to affect these innovative efforts on more of a larger scale? And I don't know if you can maybe point to some examples within Linamar where you've really leaned on that, that innovative, you know, process. Yeah, I think innovation in this time frame is, is absolutely at the forefront of so many things that we're, we're learning and seeing. And uh, a couple of things that, uh, you know, from our manufacturing base and skill level, um, we've been able to, you know, use that to be the catalyst of innovating around assistance in the area of ventilators. And, you know, it's been a really interesting last, you know, six, eight weeks, as soon as this uh, COVID crisis was among us, I mean, obviously the ventilator shortage was one key element. And, you know, we jumped in in several different projects. I mean, uh, General Motors partnered with a company called Ventec, and we're making you know 17 different uh, component systems for that uh, mm -hmm. that ventilator. So being able to use that, a company in Ontario O2, we're doing 43 different parts for them, and a company called Thornhill with a very innovative uh, ventilator system. Uh, we're going to actually we have set that up at our new iHub here. To, to do the full assembly of that. And these are all innovative products that obviously are spawned from the, the crisis we're in. Another really interesting um, uh, practical uh, device that we're going to be assembling is something that's called a, a ultraviolet light system to remove uh, basically bacteria from your, your, your phone or your iPad. And we will be, uh, you know, assembling that and making that. So I think there's a lot of different things that, that are being created to, to do different things to use baseline skills. But the innovative approach, I mean, I think the companies have to be very receptive and open. And one thing that we do on a weekly basis, as I pointed out, is we have an opportunity day, which, which is basically looking at, you know, what we're doing standard wise but also opportunities that are coming at us from these new areas of uh, around the healthcare side mm -hmm. or the spawned off products like I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, there's there's nimbleness that, that exists um, and, and varying degrees of nimbleness, right? Depending on the size of the organization. So do you see there being a bit of a slowdown 
in uh, venture capital investments that's ha taking place right now within the market? Yeah, I do think there is is a, I think as Nicholas said, like people are cautious, right? I mean, they're, they're pre this, there was a lot of money on the sidelines, but I, I don't think anybody's making major plays today because I don't think we can predict mm -hmm. the next, you know, the next, you know, week, let alone in the next month or, you know, year, quite frankly. So I think, you know, there's going to be opportunities. I mean, from a Linamar perspective, um, I think there is going to be a lot of suppliers uh, in our field that are going to struggle. One, because of, you know, you can see a whole stop of the whole market, the whole, the whole, you know, economy has stopped, never happened really before. And now, you know, there's going to be a lot of companies that are going to struggle with, you know, having to start back up and cash uh, constraints and that. So I think money will probably sit uh, for some time on the sideline, but I think for companies that can weather the storm, there'll be opportunities to pursue. Mm, that's awesome. So I, I appreciate that that deeper dive into um, into your organization, into Luminar, but then also looking also around you know the relationship that you know your uh, your subsidiaries even have with that broader market. So I appreciate that. Um, just mindful of the time, and I wanted to make sure that we had a chance to go to the, the audience to take to capture a little bit of some of the questions that have come up. So one of the first questions that I see here actually um, is being directed to Nicola. And um, Nicola, the question is, what are your thoughts about the, the real as real estate as an investment right now? Yeah, well, we had a bubble, uh, which was at its peak uh, in March. So this surely will affect real estate prices. There will be people unable to pay uh, their mortgages. Mm -hmm. There will be issues. So the housing prices will go down for sure. And they're already uh, on a decline. Uh, but then there will be people who will postpone putting their houses on the market because of the situation. So uh, there will be a slowdown in, in real estate uh, prices. Uh, and you know, you, you want to buy again at the extreme pessimism. And we don't see that yet in real estate. So if you want to invest in real estate at the moment, um, I, my, my general advice would be to hold. Whatever you want to do now, just hold until we learn more about this uh, crisis and this. Th the problem here is um, it depends not only on our government and their expertise to handle the crisis and their knowledge about the virus. It also depends on the behavior of the population. So you have like two inputs which are determining the final outcome of this pandemic. So given all the uncertainty, uh, I, I wouldn't go into real estate investments now. I would basically just hold to whatever I'm doing and, and, and wait until I obtain more information. Mm, thanks for that. That's good advice. Um, a next question that we have is actually for Jim. So Jim, what is it? Um, what does Linamar think about the trend on the shift to electric vehicles and how how has your positioning of themselves, uh, how do you see that trend? Yeah, clearly, again, it's a geographical discussion as well. Um, you can see clearly in Asia, they have you know, put a lot of incentives behind electric vehicles. And so there's been a huge surge uh, for that in Asia. Europe as well, I would say, has a, a major shift to electric vehicles, but there's been some pullback on that. and talk about diesel again in Europe as a mainstream and a little slower pace. In North America, um, certainly uh, EVs have a prime spot for the future, but it'll be a slower ramp in curve, um, of course, um, just because of, you know, you look at oil prices and just the whole political system at this point in time is not uh, driving that in the marketplace. The other big part is, you know, the cost of an EV is is higher. And I think, you know, in today's reality, people aren't really looking to spend more unless there is, you know, government incentives, which which there is. From Linamar, we certainly are, um, you know, we have product lines, you know, we have uh, e-axles, electronic axles, we've got uh, different, different parts in the vehicle that are sort of agnostic, uh, to, to any EV platform or ICE uh, traditionally. So I would say our content per vehicle, we have a roadmap to have the same content per vehicle regardless of architecture. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this next question is actually um, addressed to both of you, but Jim, while we have you here with us, I might just go ahead and ask you for your response first. 
Uh, in your opinion, how will the economic and financial impacts of COVID-19 change how we conduct business in the future? Yeah, it's a very... Uh, it's a loaded question. <laughs> It's an interesting question. And as I said, you know, uh, predicting the future is easy. Predicting it right, that's, that's the difficulty. And, you know, I think that um, this, this shock wave was, you know, hit us all really, you know, fast and furious. And even though we knew what was going on in Asia, I mean, we had advanced sort of notice. Our guys were shut down. But until it really came, I mean, it's, it's almost like, you know, I remember the the NBA when it's when they stopped, right? They found something and it stopped. It just all sort of, you know, panned out. I think the preparation for another pandemic or, you know, um, a lot of people are talking about localization as well. I think there's gonna be more localization uh, that happens. You, you really see in the healthcare side that a lot of uh, uh, people are saying, hey, you know, we better make sure that we have our PPE, we have our, you know, systems all here and not rely outside of here. So I think there's going to be a massive reflection of this whole COVID situation down the road. Um, and I think people, this there'll be a long memory to this. And I think we will be setting up standards, um, you know, to reflect on this and, and put them into our process. So hard to predict, but certainly I think there will be definite changes to how we will be running companies and, and countries. Mm -hmm. I appreciated your thought just now when you said massive reflection. I think absolutely that's something that is needed and, and we'll probably be seeing for the next little while. Um, Nicola, taking the question over to you to get a sense, what are your thoughts then on what this, you know, future impact of this will have? Yeah, well, it's, uh, I also agree with Jim. Uh, I, I think there will be a, a long memory process, as we call it here, because this will introduce a permanent shift in our behavior, in a way. And even if there is no second wave, there will always be a possibility of a third wave or something. So people will always, uh, I mean, at least for a significant amount, amount of time, will change their behavior. And I think there will be more social distancing happening. Uh, people will be more cautious, spending cash uh, and all that. Uh, so, I, yeah, unfortunately, I expect a permanent shift in our behavior, uh, at, at least for the foreseeable future, because it's so difficult to predict. Mm -hmm. This has uh, nothing to do with any historical data we can use to predict the future. And even if it does uh, resemble 1918, uh, it was a long time ago. So it's a, it was a different market. It was, a, it was after the First World War. Mm -hmm. So there is nothing to use in the past to predict the future for this. And in addition, we don't understand this fully. And, and that's the big, biggest issue. Even our governments are, are struggling and, and doctors are struggling to understand this virus. Uh, and, and then to, to try to uh, relax and, and, and go back to, to the normal behavior, uh, it's gonna take a while. So it's gonna be some kind of new normal uh, that will be different from the old normal. And, and yeah, that, that sounds pessimistic, but we have to be cautious. That's why I'm saying this. I'm actually optimistic. <laughs> Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, I just add one thing to Nicola, because I think it's an interesting, the psychology of this, right? I mean, um, if you think about consumer behavior that's going to come after this, I mean, that's where everybody's trying to think, where's that going to go? But I mean, for six to eight weeks, I mean, we have been told as a society to stay inside in, and isolate. Mm -hmm. and almost to a, and I don't, almost to a public shaming perspective, right? Almost to that level. Yeah. And now what we're saying is, okay, let's come back, right? And, and people have a fear, right? And there's, there's this fear element. And so I think as leadership, we need to install, you know, the hope and that we are putting practical measures in place to get us back on track. But that back on track, it's going to take time for people to, you know, recognize, because we've come through such a, a very fearful and psychological issue um, in, in our society that is really, I think, unknown. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, that shift that you're just talking about, I think there's, there's the, the, the people, the policy, you know, like there's, there's going to be implications across a number of different facets right now. And, and you're right. And, and Nicola, it's not to say that it's a pessimist view. I think it's important right now that we have a realistic view, right? And so it's not to perhaps make some uh, assumptions about things that are just unclear at the moment and very, you know, quite unknown. 
Um, the next question that I have come forward, it's quite technical, so I'm going to read it just to make sure that it is actually for Nicola. So the question is pertaining to stocks. Is it wise to sell if the stock has a lower probability of increasing and using funds to buy a different stock at a current lower value that may have a greater chance of increasing? Uh, well, how do you, well, <laughs> I, I would counter that with a question like, how do you know that it has a low probability of, of, of increasing? It, it's difficult to measure uh, probability in, in stock analysis, in, in, in what we call fundamental analysis. So what I would recommend is to understand the fair value of any stock you're considering buying, understand if it's undervalued, understand your risk tolerance, and then decide how you would like to proceed. So it's not really easy to say, oh, this stock has a low probability, this one has a high probability. We don't know that. We really have to do our uh, you know, homework and, and, and study this, uh, you know, all the financial statements, everything we know about a stock. And if it's really undervalued, and if it's an industry that has a, a potential perhaps to grow in the future, uh, I wouldn't buy airline stocks now. Uh, I mean, I, I'd buy uh, bulk foods and consumer staples, uh, you know, st or, or telecommunications, maybe Zoom. I don't know, I'm, I'm not advising you to buy Zoom. I'm just saying that there will be a, a, an, an increase in value of like in, in these companies which provide uh, conference calls and all that. So yeah, I guess I answered the, it, in yeah, no, way. that's good. That's good. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> no, it's good. Um, Jim, I have I have one for you here. The question is: Will manufacturers accelerate the shift to automation, permanently displacing the workforce? Um, automation has been something sort of underway for some time. I mean, you know, if you talk about AI and and things like that, there's been a shift towards automation, and not for um, you know, just taking people out. I mean, we, you know, for some period of time, we could not get people to do certain jobs. So automation has been doing that. Um, and I think there's going to be a shift to more skilled level jobs, um, semi-skilled level jobs in the future. And I do think, you know, this um, COVID uh, situation could enhance and be a catalyst to further that, you know, because again, you're talking about spatial distancing and things like that. And, you know, it's unfortunate because I had a couple pictures that would show some of that, um, you know, in our, what we've had to do in our plants, right? Where we've had to, you know, coming into a plant, we've had to, you know, on cafeteria tables, put up plexiglass mm -hmm. in washrooms. We put up, you know, partitions between each, you know, um, washing station. So I think there will be a, a move to that as well. Um, but our, our view of automation is really, you know, it's advancing and taking some of the jobs that people don't want to do and automating those uh, routine and rudimentary things and then ups, upskilling our, our people. And ultimately, we think that's not going to um, deteriorate the amount of employment. It can help us uh, for the future. Uh, no, thanks for that. When we were talking about the automation, um, you know, that process, it actually is a really nice lead into this next question because it, it really does address around productivity. And this question, and I'd like to hear both of you, uh, Jim, maybe we'll start from your standpoint. Um, so one of Canada's biggest challenges is productivity. So how can we address the issues caused by COVID on this challenge? Yeah, so productivity in Canada, I think, again, um, you know, we would probably push back on Canada not being productive. Mm -hmm. uh, Linamar, I would say our most productive facilities are in Guelph, and we have a very productive workforce here. So, and there's, you know, mechanisms of measurement that we would have to, you know, look at in regards to productivity. But certainly there's a worldview that, uh, you know, Canada would not be a lower cost uh, area. So I think, you know, one of the things to me is you always come back to the philosophy of the business and, and putting the right mechanisms in place to measure yourselves to produ uh, productivity levels. You know, we use, you know, sales per person, we use, you know, um, cost per floor space uh, per square foot. So we use very uh, good productive measurements to ensure you know, that we're productive against different global standards. So I think um, when we look at productivity, um, the key is you know, training of your workforce and making sure you have the right equipment 
And, uh, and again, the philosophy of thinking big and acting small, I think is really critical as well for um, keeping productive. It's, you got to think of it like your own business. And, and if you can get everybody thinking like an owner, that's probably the ultimate um, goal. If I could just ask a follow-up question to that before I jump over to, to Nicola, and just while I do so, a reminder to the audience that there is a second poll that's been put up, so if you wanted to take a moment and complete that. Um, Jen, you just shared with us a couple of ratios that are used to measure productivity. How do you see that shifting now when, you, when we've just explained how we need to make some changes to um, you know, how people are interacting with one another around social distancing? How, how is that going to have an impact on those ratios, those productivity ratios that you just described? Yeah, I think um, when you look at automation, your sales per square foot, I mean, quite frankly, should be able to go up because you can put equipment a lot closer. And if you have more automation, you have less sort of um, operators or labor. So you should see, you know, your sales per square foot go up. Um, certainly when you look at um, your, you know, overall uh operating efficiencies. Um, certainly automation um, can enhance that as well because you know they don't take breaks and things like that. So a lot of those things can enhance the productivities while your people are upskilling to do more of the setups and more of the, the launches. So like our view is you could probably fit more into the space mm -hmm. and people to upskill and you're still using the same level of people but you're putting more in, which creates a, a more productive uh, output environment. Right. Thanks for that. I appreciate that clarity. Um, so, so Nicola, if I could actually uh, take a moment and hear from you, your thoughts on that productivity challenge that we're seeing and what do you anticipate being that uh, the forward impact of this? Uh, okay. Well, I'm not an expert in productivity, but I, <laughs> I will uh, just add uh, to, to what Jim said. Uh, uh, I, I think the key is autom automation. I, I think that's important and that will determine the future of uh, how we conduct business, like how much of the AI we use and how effective it is uh, and whether it can uh, uh, increase productivity in, in, in some way. Uh, but also it's an issue of corporate governance, uh, in my opinion. Uh, and it's all about incentives and motivation. Uh, so in addition to automation, I also see that as a corporate governance issue. And, and, and also, um, uh, yeah, I, I think that that would be all, yes. No, I appreciate that. No, thank you. That's a good perspective, bringing in that overarching uh, governance lens onto it certainly is very helpful and something that, that we need to be mindful of. Um, Jim, something that you said earlier sparked a question for one of our viewers, and it was coming back to that consumer mindset. Um, you know, um, if we have this need to rebuild and to recover right now, do you see this change, this, this rebuild change that we're going to see? Is it, you know, are you seeing it kind of globally across your entire organization or is there particular regions that you're pointing to that you see more of a, a consumer behavior rebuild that maybe that's necessary or that's more prominent? I think um, it's, it's interesting again around the world when you look at Asia, um, you know, they were down in February and I'm talking automotive now, I could mm -hmm. talk ag and, and aerial work platforms too, but in automotive, they were down 85% year over year. So a huge hit in, in the automotive. March, they were about 50%. April, they were only 14%. So they, they've rebounded fairly quickly. There is some government incentives that they're, they're bringing in. In Europe, I mean, we're yet to see, they're basically, let's say, back 15% uh, in automotive right now in, in starting in May. And the government over there, I'm now talking Germany, has talked about bringing in an incentive, but they said, we're gonna delay the decision for a month. Now, mm -hmm. what does that do to psychology? It means I'm gonna wait a month, right? So, yeah. so and, and then North America, I mean, if anybody is, remembers Cash for Clunkers, um, was a big system that uh, North America put in place to, to enhance people starting to buy cars again. So I do think there will be you know, incentives to help induce um, this, but again, I think governments, um, maybe Nick has a comment on it, but governments are getting tapped out, right, on, on the amount of things that they can do because they put a lot of money down uh, in the last, you know, you know, six, eight weeks. No, I, I agree. And it's, uh, it's very interesting when you talk about the, 
um, you know, something going forward that I'm mindful of that you've said before, uh, Jim, with respect to not just li liquidity, but with, with the covenants as well, right? And just looking at that, the after, the aftermath of the after COVID, right? Like what, what the impacts that we're going to see. Yeah that, that. yeah, that, you know, that's a really important uh, point too. And, and I think, again, I would uh, be <laughs> receptive to anybody pushing around the government to ask for that help because, again, you know, we got to come out of this in a competitive way. And so if, if someone's going to bust up on covenants, what does that do? It makes us more uncompetitive, mm -hmm. right? So if I, if I come out of this and I bust a covenant to a net funded debt to EBITDA, uh, you know, net uh, metric, um, just by a bit, I mean, the banks can come in and renegotiate and, you know, I up you 3%. Now, what does that do? It makes us uncompetitive during a tough time that we've got to come out of this gate. So I think that's another, you know, in my mind, you know, liquidity is important, but also the covenant side. Mm -hmm. No, thanks for that. And, you know, it certainly brings to mind just the, the, it highlights the complexity, right? The layered process, not just in terms of rebuilding regions, but then also that renegotiating within the market that we, that businesses have been established in and now we're needing to re, you know, re, renegotiate our brand, renegotiate the process, the productivity, all of those aspects of it. Um, I have a, a question here for Nicola. Nicola, one of your students, one of your students is actually uh, in the audience here with us Good. today. <laughs> and um, they ask, they say, please ask Nicola how this crisis impacts VAR for firms and their valuations going forward. Well, VAR is, is, is stands for value at risk, uh, which is the maximum loss we're willing to tolerate at a given probability. Mm -hmm. That comes from one, one of my courses in risk management. Uh, I think this uh, measure VAR will have to be uh, somehow uh, revamped to uh, to address the issue of now having more probability of, of failure, uh, which is the tail of the distribution. So I think the, the, the value of at risk will become more conservative and it will have to somehow reflect uh, what's happening uh, with the COVID for sure. Uh, just to follow up on what Jim said, uh, yeah. only, I mean, we call uh, governments lenders of last resort, uh, which means that only governments have uh, balance sheets which are uh, large and strong enough to prevent the private sector's collapse. So the only way for us to go through this uh, relatively unhurt is, is for, the, for the central government to help. The private businesses with credit easing and with direct subsidies, I think that's the only way uh, if this lasts for too long, of course. So um, that actually is a perfect lead into what I what I imagine, just given the time, is going to be our last question that I'm, you know, going to throw at both of you. Which really is, you know, what what do you see businesses that are needing now from government? I mean, Jim, you spoke briefly about, you know, the advocacy with respect to the negotiations with with uh, within the covenants aspect of it. Um, uh, you know, um, Nicola, you just gave a couple of, of, of examples in terms of the role that governments can play in terms of that divesting, investing aspect, um, uh, aspect. anything else that you can see that, and this of course can be uh, more from a localized view as well as broader federally, but what, what is it, what's your, what is your sense in terms of what are some of the greater needs right now? You want to go ahead, Nicola? Uh, you can go ahead, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I think, I mean, uh, I believe what Nicholas said earlier, I think the government uh, in Canada has done a very good job in uh, jumping in, I think, in support. I mean, this, um, the wage subsidies, the CERT, I mean, has been a really good benefit to the people uh, first and also the companies. And I think that is really uh, critical. Deferrals, I think deferrals have also been helpful. Uh, tax deferrals and also local deferrals that we've seen, um, you know, around, uh, you know, businesses, commercial relief on rentals. I think there's been a lot of, a lot of good, good things. And I think, you know, rightfully, as Nicholas says, it's, it is the government that has to now step into this situation and, and help because again, companies large or small, I mean, at the end of the day, are really the support mechanism. And if I give you a statistic, I know in 2018, Linamar paid uh, Canadian government taxes of over $400 million, okay? And if you just do the, the offshoot of that, if I localize everything, double that. So we're close to a billion dollars 
of taxes that have come from Linamar and our, our suppliers and services probably in the area. And that has gone into the Canadian system. And that's critical for our you know, governance and growth for the future. So really at the end of the day, the government has to do, you know, be flexible and whatever mechanisms that they have to pull and levers that they have to pull in the next 30, 60, 90 days, they've got to pull them, they got to pull them fast and act decisively. And again, I would say that I think in, for most cases, I think a lot of that has happened. Mm. So that whole, the notion too, uh, and I think what you've highlighted here is, is the, um, the relationship or the connection within that supply chain, within that value chain. So these deferrals that you were talking about and, and the, the reciprocal effects or the residual effect that that has, um, you know, whether it's on a renter and then how are those savings, whether it's in uh, utilities, you know, how are those savings being passed along to the consumer who, you know, inevitably is, is the next person within that, within that supply, within that value chain. Um, Nicola, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Well, yeah, sure. Uh, I, I think government will have to resort to what we call unconventional measures. And, and, and the term is, is called forward guidance, which means there should be a lot of communication between the government and all the economic agents, uh, it, firms, uh, consumers, everyone else. Uh, and this kind of communication should be open. So we all work towards the same goal. So I think government ha will have to be more transparent in what they're doing and to clearly communicate how they see the future of this unfolding and how they would like all of us to contribute to it. So that, that would be uh, very important. And, and I think it's gonna be easier in Canada than in other countries. For instance, uh, in banking, uh, all, all, all the commercial banks in Canada, the, the top six are Canadian banks, uh, which will be very helpful because these banks will have a huge economic interest as well to work with the government uh, to support the Canadian dollar, for instance. Mm -hmm. So I think Canada has a, has a better position than some of these other countries where, for instance, banks are called foreign and they don't collude with the central bank and uh, there could be problems with that. They could just leave the country, basically, some of these foreign banks. In, in, in the case of Canada, it's not going to happen. They will work together with the government. And again, the government should be very transparent and, and provide clear communication to all participants in the economy. So I'm almost envisioning a little bit of a triangulation relationship here. So we need, we talked about the need for that transparency, that relationship between banks and government, but ultimately too, uh, both of them, both parties having a relationship with business, right? And having that, that cycle effect that takes place. So really important to be mindful of that and, and the communication is going to be required. And I would even dare say the advocacy as well. So having not just a uh, you know, a poll, a poll strategy, but push as well in terms of ensuring that these programs, uh, whether it be liquidity or whatever the case may be, um, the deferrals, that, uh, that that is something that's made accessible to to all. Because perhaps in some regards, from the business standpoint, uh, not everyone maybe feels that they are as accessible. Maybe it's on the, the, the sector that they're in or maybe the size of their organization. So, so really appreciate that view. Um, so we're just coming actually up to the end and uh, one very last question and uh, this could be a, you know, what's your gut saying about this, but we, we seem to have a bit of a, a repeating uh, question in and around the price of oil. And the common question is, why do you think oil is so low? Well, you know, why, or even in, in the negative, what's your, what's your sense saying to you really quickly, high level? Uh, too much supply, very little demand in, in, in uh -huh. short. And yeah. when you have so much supply and you don't have enough storage facilities where to hold it, uh, you pay other people to take your oil and, and store it for you. Yeah. Uh, so that's why you have these negative prices. Uh, it, it was just a temporary shock. It, we don't have negative prices anymore. It just happened. Uh, but that, that's the key. So too much supply that's unconstrained because mm -hmm. of these disputes between Russia and OPEC. Mm -hmm. And then you have very little demand. I'm, I'm like driving my car twice a week. And I'm sure all of you are. Yeah. <laughs> Jim, I don't know if you have a, a thought on that, but it, it does, it does, you know, make me reflect a little bit on something that you said earlier about uh, one of your markets um, uh, looking more at uh, diesel. And I don't know if that, if there's any connection there or what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I think the, the diesel point is just in uh, Europe. They, you know, that was their traditional um, combustion concept. And I think okay. they're more back to that but i mean nicola hit it right on i think that's the supply demand and uh, really at this point in time you know 
it, until we start to ramp back up and get people driving again. Um, I don't think we're going to see much of a change. And the other thing is like the whole point around staycations, right? I mean, the whole concept of people not, you know, tourism is going to take a big hit, you know, traveling by air, you know, ultimately does that, you know, increase the amount of vehicles back on the road and people driving again, which ultimately could uh, push the oil um, back up as well, right? And that's a more of a longer term view. Well, time will tell, I suppose. I mean, we'll, we'll come back to you later, Wanje, whenever you can tell us if you were able, able to predict the future after all. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, a, a really um, special thank you to each of our guests here uh, on the webinar with us today. Uh, this does conclude our weekly series. Um, thank you so much for listening. Um, just a quick plug to let you know about next week's webinar. We're actually going to be taking a moment and diving into human resource, organizational planning, um, you know, post COVID-19, that era. Um, we have a few guests that will be joining us next week. We have from the Lang School, Dr. Nita Chinther. We have Sandra Kassaran, who is the HR manager and chapter chair with HRPA, as well as Greg Pinks, who's the chief leadership op um, officer with Axiom Performance Inc. So with that, thank you most sincerely for both of you, your time, and for those who are listening in. Uh, we really appreciate your time, at, and I you know, wish you all the best as your week closes. My pleasure. Same to you. All right. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye for now.